Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, also a technical consultant for Altium. And today, we're gonna be looking at how you can set up and run crosstalk simulations in Altium Designer while you're working through your layout and while you're routing your board. Now, there are some crosstalk tools in Altium Designer. What you can do is you can pick out victim and aggressor nets and you can look at the crosstalk between them. You can also look at this for groups of nets. Now, it doesn't do the exact same thing as a more advanced tool, but but what I like about the crosstalk tools in Altium Designer is they let you figure out what an appropriate minimum spacing level is between your nets. Then that's something you can apply in your design rules. And then you can go ahead and finish routing the board and you'll have some level of comfort knowing that the value you calculated is going to be consistent across the entire board. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, everybody, so if you want to follow along with any of these demos that we're doing, go get your free trial of Altium Designer. There's a link in the description. You can go download it for free and follow along with any of the videos that we do with tutorials. So what we're gonna do in this tutorial is we're gonna continue looking at some of the signal integrity tools in Altium Designer. In a previous video, we went over some of the theory behind crosstalk, some of the concepts that help you understand the different types of crosstalk and how crosstalk actually arises in a PCB. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how to analyze crosstalk between two nets in an actual layout. So what I've got pulled up here on the screen is a portion of our demo that we like to use just to illustrate length tuning. But what I have here is I have a processor on the right side, and then I've got a DDR chip on the left side. What I'm gonna do is first just route a couple of these traces across the board. And as we route these traces across the board, you'll be able to pretty easily easily see uh, how they end up clustering together a little bit and why you might then need to run some crosstalk simulations. As is typically the case with a BGA, what we'll do is we'll just kind of start from the fan out, route straight across. And you know, of course, this being a BGA, uh, none of these traces are actually matched up in terms of the pins on each side of the components. But uh, we can go ahead and start doing a little bit of routing here. Um, let me go ahead and zoom out with this trace. Okay, so then we can route this guy up here like this. So not the cleanest routing, but you know, it gets us started and that's okay. Um, I guess if we wanted to access D10 here, we would need to use a via somewhere in here. Um, and then we would be able to make that connection. But we've got three uh, traces here that are routed across the board and I've tried to route them straight across. But what you might end up finding is that in some situations where you have a very narrow bus like this, and by narrow, I mean like, you know, packed into a small space, is that you end up having a situation where if you measure the distance between these traces, you may not be obeying the classic 3W rule. So there are these rules of thumb of about how to size traces, how to space out traces, what to put in your board, things like this. One of those is a 3W rule, and there are many of these different alphanumeric code types of rules of thumb, but the 3W rule um, basically says that you should space out traces by a factor three of their width meaning take the width, multiply it by three, that should be the spacing between traces. The idea behind doing that is to prevent crosstalk between them. So just looking at the center to center distance, we're at uh, 12.857 mils. However, this trace has a width of 5.66 mils. And so 5.66 times three gets me to 16.98, so basically 17 mils. So we're actually below the 3W rule limit. now. I'm not gonna say that rules of thumb are necessarily wrong or that you shouldn't use them. They're really a way for you to kind of get an idea of what's going on in the board and to help you uh, basically uh, hit a conservative limit in your design. Now, there are times when you can definitely violate those rules uh, if you can, of course, justify it. So this type of simulation that we're gonna look at here between this trace and this trace is gonna help us analyze if we have too much crosstalk and if we can just leave these with violating that 3W rule, or if maybe we need to space them out a little bit more like D9 and D12 here. So you'll notice here D9 and D12 have a little bit larger spacing. That spacing is 15.63. So we're a lot closer to this 17 mil uh, 3X limit here. So that's what we're gonna look at now. 
So to uh, set up a crosstalk simulation in Ultium Designer, there's a few things that you need to do. First, you need to go into the tools. And then inside of the tools uh, menu, you'll see right here, there's an entry for signal integrity. Just click on it. Then when you click on it, you will usually see this, uh, this uh, dialog pop up that says not all components have signal integrity models set up. So that is fair. Most components do not have signal integrity models attached to them. You need to attach a signal integrity model in one of two ways. The first way and really the simplest way is to just base it on the logic family in your components. So if you know the logic family that your components use, then you could assign a model based on that logic family. The other option is to use an IBIS model. IBIS stands for Input Output Buffer Information Specification. And this is a behavioral model that operates on a pin by pin basis. So it assigns the electrical behavior of a model by a pin by pin basis and you assign this model to a pin in your component. So that is the other route to go. Some manufacturers make this available to you and you can download those, bring them into your design tool and then apply that uh, in your schematics to your components. But what we're gonna do instead of going into the IBIS route is we're just gonna look at the logic family route. So that's what we're gonna do here. Our two components that we're looking at are U1 and U4. And so here it says model found, but really this is just me playing with the, with, uh, the uh, software earlier and just setting a model what we're going to do is we're just going to set a couple of different logic families here and uh, Texas Instruments actually has a really good guide on logic families that are used in integrated circuits so that guide uh, will actually go ahead and link to it in the description um, so you can go ahead and go read it and you can see where uh, which different types of components use different logic families so once we've got uh, these logic families set up um, what you will want to do then is click update models and schematic. Um, you'll see a bunch of warnings pop up here. Um, don't worry about it for the moment. It's just telling you that there are other components that don't have models found. Since we're just worried about U1 and U4, that's okay. Um, we're just gonna set, focus on those two. So uh, U4 and U1, we've assigned the HC logic family after we've assigned that and clicked update models and schematic. We can click analyze design. So it's gonna go through and run a bunch of data and uh, give us some information here on those different nets in the design. And so if you remember here, we're looking at D8, D9, and D12. So those are the nets that we wanna look at here uh, in this uh, dialogue. So here we've got D8, we've got D9, and we've got D12. So we had D8 and D9 closer to each other. So let's look at the crosstalk on those. To do that, we just select these click the right hand side button. Uh, that's gonna add them into this section. We're gonna leave termination unchecked for the moment. We'll come back to it and look at it here in just a moment. And then we're gonna set D8 as the aggressor. And now we're ready to run this. If I just click crosstalk waveforms, you will then see that it generates a lot of results. And we can now see what the crosstalk is. So what this is showing you is it's showing you what's happening on net D9 on component U4, pin R10, okay? And you can see here, we've got about 50 millivolts of crosstalk on the rising and falling edges uh, in, the, in these nets. Um, here, you can see what happens at U1, D2, so U1, pin D2, on net D9. And you can see here on this victim net, we have uh, about, this looks like about 20 millivolts of crosstalk. Is that too much? Is that not enough? Uh, can we you know, withstand more crosstalk? Uh, so for that, you need to compare that to your signal level here. Now here, because in this PCB, we've actually taken the layer stack manager and inside of that, we have programmed in a pretty small distance from the top layer down to the plane on the next layer, we would expect lower crosstalk. So that's exactly what we're seeing here in these results. We're expecting lower crosstalk that's exactly what we're getting. That ground net helps to uh, shield those traces from other traces by reducing loop inductance, also reducing the parasitic capacitance between those two traces. Now, just to illustrate what happens here, if maybe we change, let's say D8, and um, let's say we you know, drag this out just a little bit, you wouldn't normally route it like this, but you, know, you certainly could. Um, if we do that, and we go back here into 
this uh, dialog, hit reanalyze design. It's gonna go back through and do this again. Just select D8 and D9, add them back in, set D8 as the aggressor, hit crosstalk waveforms, and it's gonna generate a new window. And we can look and see what happens here. So we've seen a pretty significant reduction in the crosstalk. Originally, this was about 50 millivolts. It's now down to seven and a half millivolts. So that's a big reduction. And same thing over here. We've got about a factor six reduction here on the other side here on uh, U1 pin D2. So we get a pretty big reduction in the crosstalk. So that's pretty remarkable and it should illustrate the entire reason that we prefer to use spacing to reduce crosstalk. Spacing or increasing the spacing between nets is the most effective method and the simplest method to use crosstalk. I understand that in wide parallel buses like DDR, it can be difficult to do that, but if you think ahead and you try and plan for it, you can opt for or you can allow for some wider spacing uh, between those nets and you'll be able to reduce crosstalk. As I said previously uh, in this simulation, we left off termination. Now, what if we applied some termination here? And uh, maybe instead of performing a sweep, we just set a value of let's say 22 ohms. What's gonna happen to our crosstalk? And can we compare those? Well, here, what we've done is we've gone ahead and compared, or we've set up two different simulations here. We've got no termination and series resistor termination. So let's go ahead and take a look at crosstalk waveforms here with these two different terminations. So you can see what happens to the signal with these terminations, just by looking in this region of the waveform, uh, the red is with no termination, and you can see that there's just a little bit of overshoot, and here the uh, yellow is with termination, so with 22 ohm series termination, and you can see it very nicely smooths that out a little bit. And what do you see here in the corresponding crosstalk results? Well, here on uh, net uh, D9, uh, pin, our, uh, component U4 uh, seen at uh, pin R10, uh, we had 50 millivolts of crosstalk. And what happens when we apply the series termination? Well, you can see that it is very small. So that crosstalk is, uh, in fact, I got to zoom in pretty far to even see it. Um, it's just a few millivolts. So that's pretty impressive. So this should illustrate one strategy to reduce crosstalk, which is Termination. Termination can also dampen crosstalk because remember this is a capacitive or an inductive response and it tends to be under damped, which is exactly what we see with the no termination case. When we then have that series resistor, we're essentially adding in some damping and so it reduces the magnitude of this crosstalk. So does that mean you should go around applying termination on every single net just because you have some crosstalk to try and reduce the magnitude of the crosstalk? Well, not necessarily because remember, here, we're just using a logic family to simulate all of this, and that may not match the actual behavior of the, uh, the signal uh, that is being generated from the pins on these uh, components. So just because you see some termination effect here doesn't necessarily mean that you should go around applying termination on your particular components. Also, your components could have on-die termination. So then if you add in another resistor to apply more termination, you've now probably over terminated that component. And so as a result, you could actually take a situation where there were no reflections and then you create new reflections. So again, don't just go around applying termination just because you have a crosstalk problem. That may not actually be the right solution. The right solution could be as simple as just increasing the spacing between components. Next, I wanna look at some other stuff that you can do here in this simulator. Um, one thing that you can do here is you can set, uh, you can set limits on when it marks some of these uh, nets pass and fail. And then you can even look at some signal integrity rules in the PCB rules and constraints editor. Now, one of my favorite portions of this uh, dialogue is the stimulus editor. So the stimulus editor lets you play around with uh, the stimulus that is being generated in this uh, crosstalk and reflection waveform simulator tool that is in Altium Designer. So here by default, it's gonna set when the stimulus starts, when the stimulus stops, 
how often they repeat. So while you're playing with this, what you can do is you can actually change when the stimulus start time begins and when the stimulus ends. And so by doing that, you could actually uh, essentially simulate very short pulses and you can look at the, the transient response on this interconnect. So let's just say I wanted to look at like a 500 picosecond pulse. What I can do is I can change this to 10.5 nanoseconds. So you'll notice here it starts at 10 nanoseconds, ends at 10.5. I can go ahead and hit OK. Um, we're going to ignore this error for the moment, but we just hit OK. Hit OK here. I'm going to reanalyze the design. And then we're going to look at the crosstalk waveforms as soon as this finishes. So let me add back in the nets. Set D8 as the aggressor. We'll check this out again. So here in this window, what you're actually looking at is you are looking at what happens on each of these nets when we have a very short stimulus. So this very short stimulus rises up near its maximum at about 500 picoseconds, so about uh, just a fraction of the way across this waveform. And then you can see the transient response as soon as that stimulus ends. Um, you can also see it on this particular portion of this graph, uh, which is observed at U1 uh, pin E1 uh, on net D8. So remember, U4 is our source, U1 is our destination. So you're actually seeing what the transient response is at the end of that interconnect. So that's pretty cool. Then you're able to see what the transient response is uh, due to crosstalk. And so you can actually see that very clearly as well. So this is really important because these transient responses can be used to get transfer functions along each of these transmission lines as well as between these transmission lines. So this is a pretty coarse method, but it's a decent way to estimate some of those, uh, some of those transfer functions. And that's a little bit more of an advanced signal integrity topic, but it's a fun math topic and it's something that I love to talk about. So, and this is something we might do more videos on in the future. So uh, I'm gonna leave it at that because it is an important topic, but um, I don't wanna get too, too deep into it in this video. But this is essentially everything that you need to know about the, uh, the crosstalk analyzer in Altium Designer. So if you wanna get much more accurate results, again, you're gonna to have to go beyond the logic family description for your components, and you're gonna to have to actually find IBIS models from manufacturers or online somewhere, maybe there's open source models, or what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to create IBIS models based on measurement, which I'm gonna be honest, is something I've never done before. Uh, I, now that I think about it, it's something that I should probably learn to do, and um, maybe I'll take some time to do that in the future. But for now, I hope you all had fun watching this and uh, learning how to access the Crosstalk Analyzer in Altium Designer. I think sometimes these tools can be a bit difficult to use if you've never used them before, but if you need any help with using this, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section. Go ahead and leave your questions in the comment section. You can also send us your questions to YouTube at altium.com. We love getting your questions and we hope to hear from you because we will be doing more Q&A videos here in the near future. All right, that's all I got on this topic. Thanks, everybody. And uh, definitely make sure to like the video, hit the subscribe button to help us hack that YouTube algorithm. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.